Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech-related questions. You can submit your questions down in the comments section below using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time. Right. So without further ado, Connor, this week's first question. Yeah, let's get into this from uh, Bevo Goosens 2739 I have a big stock of brake cleaner for cars in my garage. Can I also use this on the disc brakes of my bike, or do I need to buy a specific brake cleaner for bicycles? I would imagine, well, read what it says on the back of it, but I'd imagine that the brake cleaning solution is probably gonna work. It's designed to get rid of the same kind of particulate and it's also designed to get rid of oils and greases that contaminate your brake and rotors, uh, your brake pads and rotors. But um, sometimes, you know, if something's designed for a car, sometimes they can be a bit more heavy duty. So I would just make sure you take your wheels out of the bike before you clean them rather than spraying it on your frame or your, you know, yeah, say you like your shifter hoods or your bar tape or whatever. So just, yeah, just do that. But. Yeah, I think um, it, it, it could well work. There you go. Next up um, is from Elrock Stone, who says, I'm currently riding a 2014 Merida Sculptura 904, and it has 50 millimeter carbon wheels. I'm very happy with the stopping power, especially in the wet. I've priced it up, and I can do an upgrade to a disc front fork wheel cable actuated hydraulic caliper for around 600 New Zealand dollars, about 300 quid. I can't upgrade it to another similar bike for this price as my bike is almost brand new. I'm planning to keep the old fork and brake when I sell a bike, uh, so if ever I do I can put the rim brakes back on. Uh, as I understand it, most braking is in the front of the bike. My question is, is this like to improve the braking on descents in the wet or am I missing something that might be a problem later? Okay, right, bit, bit to unpick here. Yes. <laughs> Um, I think first and foremost, you should look at your stopping power with your rim brakes and what you could do to address that. Mm. Maybe look at different pads, um, yeah. compounds there that or could make a difference. Or aluminium rim wheels. Yeah. You know, if you're really concerned about the stopping power, just put aluminium rims in. I think so. And, and like, if you're, it depends where you're riding too. Like if you're doing big mountain descents and that, that, that is going to be an issue. Um, I mean, personally, my experience of using carbon rims with rims, the stopping power does decrease in the wet. Yeah. One little trick I used to have was just to kind of pump the brakes first. So you, you, you have to think about, you have to like pump the brakes a bit, kind of almost like cleans the rims, then you go through actual braking. Yeah. Because um, the first time you put them, <laughs> that's not, not much. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, my, my instinct would be like fair play for looking into this like upgrade thing. But you're going to create some kind of like Franken bike, and for 300 quid or 600 New Zealand dollars, I would be inclined to save that money and save towards your next bike, and then put that towards a dedicated disc brake bike as your next bike. Plus, if you if you just sold your existing bike as you know as well, like when you come to buy your next bike, you'll get some money for that, which can then go towards it as well. Um, I think that's just going to be a lot more sensible way to go about it than having a bike that's kind of got a front disc and a rear rim. And Yeah, I, th I do think experimental brake compounds will make a difference yeah. too. Yeah, I would go more down that like, route. You're never going to have the same power as discs, let's face it, but I think you would improve your stopping power. Um, so I think go down that route before you start start Frankenstein on your bike. Yeah. Um, next question is from SM hyphen YH7. Ah, rest, catchy name. Uh, off topic. Why well, I don't understand. Off topic, I don't understand the applications for road tires. What's the difference between racing, training, and all weather? Slicks versus different treads. Thanks. Well, we could go into a lot of depth here. Yeah. But I think. Well, me we... and Alex behind your back call you Captain Chinterato. <laughs> I do love. So, basically, okay, right. Let's delve into it. Explain <laughs> why I'm Captain Chinterato. Because there is there are tires out there for any use. I think if you if you're racing, you're looking for something that's going to have it's going to be super fast, um, low rolling resistance, um, but at that expense, you may sacrifice a bit of puncture resistance. Um, tires not going to be quite as thick, um, and therefore, if you're doing lots of training rides or you're just going out for an everyday spin, you want you don't want to be sitting on the side of the road for mm. some punctual time. It's not the best shout, but if you want to go fast, there you go. Training tires, um, they last longer as well, so you can get and more miles cheaper. out of them. They're cheaper, better puncture protection too, so you're not 
doing the old aforementioned. Yeah, you know, if you're going, you know, I, um, well, for the, the, the Tour de Station recently, I used the, the P0SL, which is like their top of the range performance all round race tire. But they're ex they are expensive. They're more expensive than Chinterato. Yeah. And I didn't have any punctures and there were some gravel sections in this race. But because of the cost of them, it's like if you just went out on your training ride and cut them, that way you'd be, you'd be gutted about that, which can happen. So I think, yeah, for like, for training, it's exactly that, you know. Yeah, and then I guess you also have kind of all weather tires, you have that increased grip as well. So if you're riding in the winter, um, you've got increased grip, bit better puncture protection, uh, but at the expense of, yeah. of speed. So the difference with the all weather tire and the sort of training tire, like the Chinterato, is the all weather tire tends to have the same fast tread compounds as the performance road tire, but they're a bit more heavy duty. So they've got a bit more puncture protection. So it's just like halfway between. Yeah. But the, the all weather tires are generally quite expensive as well. So then personally, I always opt for a tire here at GCN, which is probably more towards the all weather training tire, puncture resistance side of things. Basically, because we use our bikes so much um, and quite often we're on shoots in the middle of nowhere and I don't want to puncture. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Uh, the speed isn't my aim, so that's um, I, I go for that. Yeah. And the fact that I don't need to do quite as much maintenance and changing tyres. Oh, that's fair enough. Um, who's the next question from? But I do whack the fast tyres on when I want to. And I've started to. I've realize, never seen you use fast tyres. I've, I've started to put them on <laughs> <laughs> now because I'm, I'm getting slower. <laughs> I can't give up with Alex and Ollie. So I'm having to employ <laughs> these tricks. Anyway, next up from Premzek K. Do you want to take this one away, Ollie? Yeah. Is there an official statement <coughs> from frame manufacturers or brands confirming that using your road bike in a home roller does not put damage or unnecessary strain on the rear frame? On the road, we push the bike side to side when putting heavy power down. With the bike in a stationary trainer and the rear frame fixed to a roller, the power goes through the frame. Thoughts? Yeah, there was a thing, actually. Um, so, for example, like Canyon bikes. For a while, they their frames weren't actually officially recognized for use on trainers. And then, like a few years ago, they did actually put out a statement going, our bikes are like fine for like indoor stationary yeah. trainers. And now, in recent years, while in the past bikes might not have been, now bike brands, you know, big bike brands, they recognize that indoor training and um, static trainers, direct drive trainers in particular, are like a thing that's expected use of the bike because they're so popular. Brands, and I'm not speaking for all brands here, but I'm comfortable in saying like, you know, the reputable brands are all designing their bikes so that they can deal with that. It's, um, but it's one of those things where you should check on a case by case basis, is the bike suitable for that? And, and brands all have like these little web chat things on their websites now. So if you're considering a particular brand of bike, just go and open up a web chat with them on their on their online website and ask the question and they'll tell you for that specific brand. There you go, yeah. And to add, I've been using home trainers yeah. for a lot of the time in my career on different bikes and never had an issue. No. So. Jonathan Middleton, 1390, sent this one in. I have a second-hand bike that was well ridden by the previous owner. I had started to skip through the gears, coming from the smallest to the largest cog. Tried indexing, adjusting the derailleur, and replaced the shifting cable with no joy. Before I start to look uh, to replace the rear derailleur, is there anything else I should try? Um, I also currently run 105 10 speed. Brand new option is not available to my knowledge. What other options do I have other than a second-hand gamble replacement? So the issue um, is I the suspect skipping. that there's probably, I mean, that the, with it being well used before <clears throat> and, you know, um, replacing the shifting cables and indexing, the most likely candidate here right now is that the cassette and chain is worn. Yeah, I was going to say worn chain and cassette. Yeah. So. Or one's maybe been replaced and the cassette's worn yeah. or a newish chain. So on if you go to your local bike shop, um, and it's a useful tool to have at home because they're, they're inexpensive, but a chain checker tool is a good one to have in your home mechanics workshop. But like I said, the, the local bike shop will have them and, th and they can check the chain wear for you and that will tell you if your chain is worn the, um, and needs replacing. If your chain is worn and needs replacing, then I would say your cassette also needs replacing because the cassette has been run with a worn chain for too long and, and it, so that will need replacing as well. So 
that would be the first thing to, to try in that instance. Yeah. And also looking at that, that um, chamber on the front as well. That yeah. could be worn as well. Um, yeah. Um, so I look at those before you start going towards the der derailleur, if I'm honest. Yeah. The um, next question, Dave M890, quick question, quick fire question. With pro riders now riding different disciplines, for example, road world champ, is, for example, is a road world champion allowed to wear their champion jersey with the rainbow bands in a mountain bike race? Well, Connor, as a former national <laughs> champion on the road, so um, the answer is, if you're a champion in a certain discipline, be it national, European, or Pan American, world, you're you're wearing that jersey in the discipline you won that jersey for. So if you won it on the road, you're wearing that in any road race. Um, so so you went and did a time trial, you no longer wear that jersey. Um, so at the moment, Evan Paul is World TT champion. You won't see him racing on the road in road stages or one day races in that world champions jersey. You'll just be wearing that in TTs. And that's the same for mountain bike disciplines, cyclocross, um, you don't see that, that crossover. Mm. There's also um, an interesting caveat to that rule. There is a caveat. I was, we've you, got you're going to say this. So, so say Matthew van der Poel is, yeah. the, is the world champion right now. If he wins the yellow jersey in the Tour de France at any point during the race, he then has a choice. He can wear either the rainbow bands or the yellow jersey. He can take his pick. Can he? Mm. Are you sure? Mm. I think he has to wear the yellow jersey. Does he? I think he does. I think that takes priority. I think there's a, so there's a, in the UCI rules, you oh, go very is it, deeply. Is it if, is it if he's? No, so if he, if he wins, it's a, there's a, a choice between, basically, if you go into UCI rules, there's one section and it lists the priority of different jerseys and cycling, is... and it rates them above each other, um, and certain jerseys take precedence over others. Ah, so if he was, Ah, uh, yeah, I think I've got this wrong. Yeah, it does get a little confusing. I think it's like if you're wearing a jersey by default because the other per So say if Pogacar yeah. had the yellow and the green jersey and he was second in the green jersey competition and was therefore given the option to wear the green jersey, he could pick... I think it's... I think that's... ...between the, the green jersey and his rainbow bands. There you go. <laughs> okay. The caveat, the caveat though I was going to The ask, quick fire just, question. Just to, <laughs> just to confuse matters is that past champions also wear the, the bands on their arm. Yeah. And that is a bit more loose, so you can wear that wherever, Because really. if you look at Connor's jersey, he has got some, some I got tricolor bit, bands. And I got in a bit of stick for wearing those in a gravel race when I won those bands on the road. But still... What? What, who are these fun police who gave you a stick for that? Basically, I think the, the, the armband is just a bit you of can a wear, of, You can wear you them can on wear gravel. Wherever, wherever, wherever you want. There it's we not, go. It's not the official. It's UCI just a has no jurisdiction here. Uh, anyway, that was the quick fire question. <laughs> yes. Jonathan Middleton, 1390. We've been, no, done, we've been on done, that one. Jonathan. <laughs> All right, last question this week. Christopher Havskov, who says, I just got a brand new bike. Um, and whenever I'm in the biggest uh, rings on my cassette, um, in both the big and the small ring, there is a slight noise, especially when I pedal hard uphill and really put down some watts. What could this issue be down to? When I'm in the 11 to 20 cogs, I don't have any issues. So I doubt there's an issue with my bearings. What do you think, Connor? So if that's biggest cogs in the cassette. When I'm in the biggest cogs on my cassette, but then it says in both big and small ring. Yes, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah, the front. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So biggest scores in the set, slight noise. I have a feeling. I reckon that could be the spacing of the cassette, maybe, is it could be too close to the spokes. Could be a bit of rub in there. It could, I mean. Might need a spacer in there behind the cassette. It could, it could be that. It could, I mean, there's lots of things it could be. It could be the noise coming from the front derailleur. Because you're at the extreme of the front derailleur when yeah, you're in, in the back, in the big yeah. ring at the back. So maybe there's a slight bit of chain rub on your front mech, in which case you need to just adjust your front mech. We've got videos, we can Space show you how it. to do that. Um, which tallies with the fact that it's happening when you're putting down the power, because that's when you do get that slight bit of flex in the frame. And that's it, yeah. When you are, yeah. When you are um, out, out of the saddle and putting the power down, yeah. As Connor says, you can, on some bikes, get a bit of flex around the bottom bracket and chainstay area, which is then caught that slight bit of flex yeah. is, is causing that slight And it's break. an annoying one to fix because you, you have to put down the power to see the issue, which you can't do when you have your bike on a stand and you just turn yeah. the pedals. So yeah, keep in mind for that. 
potentially yeah. that's your, your issue. But you, you should be able to probably adjust your, your front mech setup and maybe fix that or look at potentially something else. But yeah, hopefully you can you can fix that. A bit of, bit of troubleshooting is definitely required. It's hard to diagnose the exact cause of the sound, but they're the things that we think are the most likely. Yeah. Um, right, that's all we've got time for this week, unfortunately. Yeah, until next week. That's half an hour. Bye.